What up, guys? Don't forget about the best grill you can ever buy, a Traeger grill. Uh, super easy to use, super convenient, does everything you will ever need a grill to do. Smoke it, grill it, cook it high, cook it low, doesn't matter. Traeger gets it done. TraegerGrills.com. Head over. Get yourself a grill. The Maui Mastermind Retreat is back December 18th through the 22nd, and we are taking pre-registrations right now. Head over to the website, elliotmarshall.com. You'll see it right up in the, he in the header. It says Maui Mastermind. Click on it to say that you are interested. That's all you're doing is saying you're interested. You're not committing anything. You'll just be start to get more information here in a couple weeks when the cart opens for purchase. So Maui Mastermind, December 18th through the 22nd. Go pre-register, elliotmarshall.com. Make it happen. What's up, my ninjas? This is former UFC fighter Elliot Marshall, and this is the Gospel of Fire, where we are going to learn how to go into the fire so that we can find our power and live the best life possible. Guys, this episode of the podcast is a short one. Um, Mike Michalowicz is my guest. He is, uh, I called him an entrepreneur, or his bio at first called him an entrepreneur. He is a small business investor, is what he likes to say, that has the job of authoring, and he explained this. So uh, I don't want to ruin it here. It was, a, it was a really good short, but very interesting podcast. Um, as always, if you find the podcast helpful, if you... Huh, enjoy the episodes. Please like, please share, please leave a review. And uh, without further ado, here we go. Mike Michalowicz. Mike, what's going on, man? How are you? Uh, not too much, brother. It's good to be with you. I mean, I'm, I'm looking. It's good to be with you too. I see in your background, uh, the BU always. Uh, yeah, I, I like oh, it. Oh, yeah. Man. Tell me uh, yeah. tell me where that came from. Well, what um, there's a saying from Oscar Wilde. He wrote um, a book called Dorian Gray. And he said, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. And uh, that just lands with me. I, you know, mm -hmm. for so long, when I first started my business, I thought I had to put myself out a certain way to be perceived a certain way, but it wasn't really me. And I felt icky at best. Mm -hmm. um, but also people kind of sniffed out a rat. And so then I started leaning to who I am more and more. And I found that it actually compels and attracts more people. And it's the better way of service because you're simply you. I think that's uh, super interesting, right? Because when you, when you, just what you just said, like people, like the, the world smells fake. It does, right? And, we, and yeah. we're so attuned to it, we can sniff it out instantly. Yeah. And, and I think social media has only made it worse. You, mm -hmm. you hop on, you see people with, they're not even, that's not even the real them. It's like these fake faces now that you just click a button and it transforms how you look. Dude. Dude. Kills me. So I have some female fighters, right? And one day we were, it was fight camp. It was fight week and we were out there just hanging out, but it's kind of boring fight week sometimes. <laughs> and they were talking about the filters that girls put on themselves. Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, okay, I get it a little bit. They're like, no. And she brought up, I mean, this is totally off topic, but kind of, you know, this, you know, she brings up this picture of this girl's ass on Instagram <laughs> and she make, and I'm, she's like, looks at that. She's like, that's nice. Right. I'm like, yeah, it's real fucking nice. Yeah. And then she goes to Google and finds a picture of the same chick's ass. And it's not even fucking close. It's not even close, you know? And I'm like, that is not fair. <laughs> well, I, listen, I can tie that back into uh, to business. So yeah, for sure. What I find as many people in their business put out their favorite picture of themselves, right? So is that one perfect shot? It, they Photoshop the hell out of it and you see it over and over, but then you see this person in reality. So, you know, I'm an author, which means I do a lot of speaking. I've seen authors go on stage. I'm like, who's that old dude? Like, who's that guy? And We're like, oh, that's fishing in guy. real life. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God. And his website looks like 30 years younger. It was his favorite shot from high school. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this the consumer says, oh, that's a lie. It's like, it's like a dating app. Like, you can, you can say you're six foot seven and you're all jacked up. You show up and you're five foot four and you're a tubular. Like, right. Like, how's that person going to feel? They're like, oh, you lied to me. This is over. And so that's what consumers see. They're like, oh, your business, your 
brand, whatever they call it, your, your persona sure. has lied to me. So you start off with mistrust. I think that's the worst thing. It's, and you got to just get good with you, right? You got to get, just get good with you. And you talked about in the, at the beginning, what were you, uh, what was that process of getting good with you like for you, you know? Well, it's showing the humbling part. So um, this is a quick story about my background. Yeah. It was an entrepreneur out of college built some businesses. I sold two companies. I became a multimillionaire in my early thirties. and I thought I was all that. I, my ego exploded just to give context. After selling my second company, it was acquired by a fortune 500. I bought a Land Rover, a, a Beamer, a, a Dodge Viper all within four hours. And I'm like, look at me. And uh, I, I moved into how much expensive. money did you make on that? Uh, we sold it for over 3 million. Okay. And uh, my first business, um, I didn't, it wasn't FU money. It was definitely F me money. It was a private equity deal. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I Got wasn't it. like this crazy multimillionaire, but I was in millionaire status, right? Right. And I, and I thought this was my new life standard. Like, oh, I'll just keep selling businesses. So the next one's going to be 10 million and then 100 million. So I got I to gotta show my success. Um, dude, I was a dick. I was a fucking dick. Like the... I thought I was better than other people. And that's the, the first sign of it. Well, what happened was on my next business, I lost everything. I had no clue what I was doing. I, I, I started investing money in, in business ideas that were bad ideas. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And so those businesses went out of business. It took me two years. I wiped out everything. I lost the cars. I lost the house. I lost... Actually, you went to Maui. I had a house uh, on Lanai, which is this, the mm -hmm. island over. It's a private island now owned by uh, Larry Ellison. Yep. Um, so got a place out there. Sigourney Weaver, two houses down. She lives there. And um, I thought I was all that. I lost it all. And it was the most humbling experience of my life when my daughter, she was nine years old at the time, when I told my family we're going to lose our house, she ran to her bedroom, grabbed her piggy bank, and she gave it to me. She goes, Daddy, I'll support our family because you can't. And I actually got emotional still over it. I, I'm so, I was so ashamed and embarrassed, but also I hope that day I became de-dictified that <laughs> I realized, uh, like what guy says they want to be de-dicked? <laughs> and uh, but I just kind of woke up and said, oh my God, like, like it's, not, it's about contribution, not collection. It's about how to be of service. And I'm going to put that story out there. I've shared that story. I was terrified to tell other people that I, how much I failed. And then no surprise, but it was a surprise to me. People responded and said, oh my gosh, I failed too. Thanks for carrying that flag and saying that we can recover from that and we can move forward. I fought through depression. I talked about my experience with depression, how you move through that. And um, that was very cathartic for me, just putting it out there, uh, knowing that it doesn't cause rejection. It causes acceptance from other people. And from that point forward, it was clear, just be me, warts and all. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, uh that that line in or that that scene in uh, Goodwill Hunting. Have you ever seen Goodwill Hunting? I haven't. No. Uh, so there's a scene uh, where uh, Robin Williams is the therapist to Matt Damon, and you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Matt Damon's this young kid who you know super smart and but gets in all kinds of trouble. And uh, Robin Williams' wife died. We didn't see that, but it's the story, you know. And what he's telling, you know, they start talking about something. And he and Robin Williams goes, nah, man, you know, like what I miss is that shit that only I knew. Like mm. her farts used to be so bad in the middle of the night that it would wake the dog up. And then he was like, I would take the blame because it, you know, like, yeah, he's like, but no one else knew that about her other than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? That imperfectness that 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 we all have. That is, that really is what makes us us, right? Like you have two totally. eyes, I have two eyes, I have two ears, you have two ears. We walk, we have a job. Like these are all just similarities and they don't distinguish you at all, even though they think, we think they do. Yeah. But have you heard of people... the uh, pratfall effect by any chance? No, what is it? Uh, you may like this. So it, it's been studies down, uh, done around celebrities and they found that when a celebrity makes mistakes and has flaws, they become more likable. So it's at the end of the movie where there's like the blooper reel that we're mm -hmm. like, oh my God, like Tom Cruise is, is actually okay. Like he's a, he's a human too. The humanizing aspects make us more attractive. This is true, you know, for all of us. Look, I'll even go as far as uh, a little bit with that. Like 
God, I think that was some of the appeal to Donald Trump for people was you like, like, you know, they, these other politicians are trying to show this perfection. Like I am the answer. And That's Trump true. was just like, I'm an asshole. Like, look, this is how I'm an asshole. And some people were like, oh, God, yeah, he's an asshole. I'm an asshole. I can get down with that, dude. <laughs> right. Like horrible. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, or, you know, raw and real is mm -hmm. appealing. Um, um, yeah. I, listen, I, Trump, regardless if you like him or not, he was a master communicator. In, in simplifying a message. And uh, I think that's super powerful that yeah. within seconds, you know what he was about and what he did. And he, and he was unabashedly himself. Those are the people that get the biggest appeal. Yeah. Even if, for example, let's just say you and I don't like him. There's but the people that do fucking love him. So there, there's that, you know, like it, it works. I get it. Yeah. I totally get yeah. it. So uh, now you, uh, you are still an entrepreneur. Right. Yep. And you and explain what it is you do. Yeah. So, well, um, I have equity in, in five businesses. I now actually call myself a shareholder of small business as opposed to an entrepreneur. Okay. And there's a critical reason. An entrepreneur, I think wrongly, has been defined as hustle and grind. Like if you own a business, you got to work your ass off. And I'm mean, no, no. Entrepreneurship is about having a vision, but choreographing resources to get there. I was reading a study just a few weeks ago. 14% of the world population ever starts a business. 20% is only successful, meaning sustainable, it's a healthy business. That means 3% of the people do it right. 97% of the population is actually looking to work for a good, healthy business. Mm -hmm. So our job, an entrepreneur's job isn't to do the job, it's to create jobs. So I'm like, I better stop saying I'm an entrepreneur, because, even though I love the word, because it means hustle and grind. It means working harder than anyone else. I've decided to call myself a shareholder of small business because that means I'm an investor. I give it strategic direction. I vote for where we're going. I share in the profits because it was my investment, my risk, but I don't run the businesses. So I have um, five businesses now for a consulting business. I have a virtual reality, augmented reality company, um, and some other businesses that I am a shareholder of varying degrees. And in some cases, 100%, other times lesser. Got it. And uh, that's what I do. But my, my job, my day-to-day -day is to codify, to extract what I learn in these businesses and all the ones I study of what makes them work well, and then put that in the book. So my job is I'm an author. I'm a full-time author who's okay. also a shareholder in small business. Man, I really liked how you put this because I think you know uh, a lot. Everyone says they're an entrepreneur right now, and I agree with you. An <laughs> entrepreneur, like yeah. if you open if you open a small business, you're not an entrepreneur. You're a businessman or a yeah. businesswoman. That's it. You know, entrepreneurs have multiples. Right, they, they multiples, have multiples. Has, has vision um, challenges the norm, whatever the accepted principles are. So I'll give you an example. One of my books is called Profit First. I'm not trying to be pluggy here. Yeah, no, it's fine. But what, what I discovered is we believe, and we've been told that profit comes last. We call it the bottom line or, or you know, the year end. These are all terms and phrases say comes last. But what I also noticed is almost no businesses are profitable. Most businesses survive check by check. I'm like, hold on. If we get into our business to be wealthy or financially free, why aren't we successful? And I looked at that formula and one day I said, oh my gosh, it's because it's the bottom line. When something comes last, it's human nature to delay it, to ignore it. Most of us say profit's going to happen one day and it never does. So what I did in profit first, I flipped it. I said, profit comes first. Every time we have a sale, we take a percentage profit, hide away. It's the pay yourself first principle applied to business. Then I converted that into a business itself. So I've uh, over 600 accountants and bookkeepers who now flip the formula. They teach this new method. And to me, that's what's entrepreneurial. That there's an established approach. Profit comes last. You need your accountant to do that. We're trying to redefine saying, no, no, profit comes first. We're going to assure every transaction is profitable. And that's what an accountant really is supposed to do. Explain that more to me. Because like, for example, I, I, let's say I start uh, an, online, uh, an online store. Yeah. Right. An online store. Uh, how do I make profit first? How, yeah. how do you profit? Yeah. Right. You know. Yeah. Right. That, that, or it, let, it already starts fighting beliefs. Hold on. Let's, like, let's well, make it more difficult. Let's go uh, uh, a brick and mortar store. I, I have a bookstore. I opened a bookstore. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know? How how do I go profit first when there's all these bills to pay? Right. And and coincidentally, uh, our team was just working with a bookstore in Alexandria, Virginia, okay. last right. week. So this is as a perfect example. Um, that was not set up, by the way, everybody. Yeah, it feels we, we, had the, we, it feels we had no clue that that was happening. I, I had no clues coming. Mm -hmm. Most of us have been told that takes money to make money. So we're going in with this pre-adorned 
preordained belief that I got to pump money in to get any money out. So the first thing is, even if you're in the starting phases, why does it cost any money to get books? Do you know this bookstore reached out to authors and said, we're on our, our launch uh, month, we're going to put any books that you want on the front shelves. We're going to position that way, not based on orders, but by your contribution. So authors said, well, I, I want to get that exposure. And they gave books away. I contributed 15 bucks. I want my books there. So they were able to get an inventory for nothing. And the reason they did this is they said, well, how are alternative ways of growing my business? Inevitably, if you don't use money, you have to use something that's even more powerful and your mind. You have to think innovatively. Now that they had this start going, then they said every time there's a transaction, they make $20 on average per book sale retail. They first take the profit out of it. So it's a predetermined percentage. They run it at 15%. So a $20 book sells, they take $3, they put it into an account called profit, and they hide that money away. It's like sticking it in some kind of safe. They can't even see it. Now they have $17 to work with. Now for replenishing inventory, they have what's called a 55% discount. They have to pay about nine books to buy a book. So now $17 left, profits already been taken. So they're profitable. They take uh, uh, $9 and they put it into another account called inventory purchase. Now they start building up funds to purchase the next series of books. Now there's $8 left. That goes to payroll and other elements. So it, it all flushes out. But how most businesses operate, Elliot, is that, that 20 bucks comes in, they say, okay, payroll, buy inventory, they deplete it. I got enough money to pay uh, um, for um, a little, I don't know, new addition, new computer or something. Okay, there's nothing left. Let me make the next sale. They never think about profit. What happens, they put more and more burden on the business and actually becomes less likely to ever be profitable. They try to grow their way out of it, which is the worst way. So I was saying that profit is not an event as an eventuality. Profit is a habit. You got to bake it into the business. And that's what this bookstore has done. How did you find this? How did, how did you? Desperation. You know, I, I was talking about that uh, piggy bank moment. Yeah. My daughter put it up there and I, and I looked back and said, holy crap, I know nothing, nothing about profitability. So I, I grew two businesses. One I grew to, it was just shy of 2 million. The second one, we were on a run for 7 million. Then a company called Robert Half came in and acquired us Q1, my right. third year. It was explosive growth, but those businesses weren't profitable. I'd refinanced my house twice. I borrowed from family and friends to cover bills. I was in desperate survival mode. I looked back on my life and said, oh my gosh, I ran businesses that were sick and unhealthy. I was lucky to get out. And most business owners will never sell a business. That's just the, the fact. So that's when I started to study. I said, why aren't my businesses profitable? There was a study that came out from the SBA. SBA identified 83% of the 30 million small businesses in the US. It's a company that does $25 million in revenue or less. 83% will never be profitable. It's check to check survival. I'm like, what? We all go into business to make money and almost no one's making money. What's wrong with us? And when, as I was saying, what's wrong with us? I said, oh my God, there it is right in front of me. The formula. We are behavioral. What we do is when something comes last, wait. Like with me and exercise, <laughs> it's not your case, but for me, me and exercise, I'm like, I don't need to exercise. I, I just don't want to do it. I'll do it at the end of the day. Therefore, I'd never do it. Never do it. Eight years ago, eight years ago, I said, I'm going to start working out every day, but I have to intercept my behavior. So what I did, I monitored what I normally did. Wake up in the morning, take a leak, drink some coffee, you know, start reading the news and then skip the workout. I noticed every morning I'd wake up and go to the bathroom. So I started putting my sneakers on the toilet seat. So now when I wake up, the only way to use the toilet is by grabbing my sneakers. I'm on the feet, momentum kicks in. I go down to the gym, start working out, work out five times a, day, a week eight years consecutively. Never miss it. Because I said an intercept. What most business owners do, log in the bank account, see how much money I have, spend it. So I said, okay, that's the, the equivalent to walking into the bathroom and going to the toilet. Mm -hmm. It's going to the bank. This system can't be in the accounting system. This isn't a QuickBooks thing. Set this up at the bank. So log into your bank account, have an account right there that says profit. The money flows in, carve it out, put it in there and continue forward. What do you tell somebody who uh, they're not making it yet, right? Like you're jo you're only breaking even. Like you have this business, and I'm I'm breaking even, right? Yeah. I pay myself my I don't know four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars a month, you know. But the and I think I think right there is probably a big problem, right? Is business owners don't understand that difference, the difference between like what you pay yourself as a salary 
and then what, what profit you need, and probably they're radically what different. Profit is if if you're generating any revenue, there's profit potential. Now, listen, if you're making one dollar a year, uh, probably can't make profit. We will have to amplify sales to some degree. But a business like that, if it's making five hundred thousand a year, two hundred thousand a year, a million, there's profit in there. But we do have to differentiate. Profit is a reward to the shareholder for taking the risk of investing and starting a business. Thank you for supporting our economy. Thank you for giving jobs. And if you've no employees, thank you for paying your vendors. Those are equivalent to employees. You're providing right. for our economy. The pay, owner's compensation, is the pay for the work you do. If, if you couldn't work at your business and we had to replace you, what do you pay that person? 50 grand, mm -hmm. 100 grand, 200 grand? That's what's called a normalized salary. You need that salary because you are that guy doing that job. You also get a profit on top of that, usually a quarterly distribution as a reward for starting the business in the first place. That's how they're different. I, uh, I, I have a consulting business as well with other martial arts schools. And this is one of the things I, I and they're, everyone's so resistant to do this. I'm like, guys, look, I need you to pay yourself a salary. Oh you know? my and, they're God. Like, and they're yeah. like, well, taxes and tax differences. I'm like, look, Bro, fuck the taxes. Like, I, I don't think you're right, but whatever. Fuck the taxes, right? Like, it's a minuscule amount at the end of the day. It sets the mindset different because you need to replace yourself, right? Like, you don't want to be the general manager of the school. That's right. Like, no, it's not, no. Like, I, I did a quick survey. So, uh, as much as I like to exercise now, I also like to visit McDonald's. I can't deny it. When I travel, I stop by <laughs> McDonald's. I started, I started this routine. This is about two years ago. I would stop at a McDonald's and say, may I speak with the owner? At first, I was just curious on how they run so efficiently. Do you know in 50 visits, the owner's never been there? No, crazy. Never. I go, I go to cashier. I'm like, may I talk to the owner? One, one place they said, oh, the owner was in two weeks ago to pick up the money. To pick up the money. Yeah. I was like, that's it. It isn't that these owners are lazy, sitting on the beach, drinking Mai Tais. And maybe they are. That's cool. That's what they decide. But most of them are doing the hardest thinking uh, that's necessary. Uh, where's the next location? How am I going to expand this? How do we run more efficiently? What do I can I, can I learn from the headquarters? They are working at the highest level. And the only way to do that is by not being in that glorified closet that they call an office at the McDonald's store. Right. That is for the rank and file. And I don't mean that negatively. Most people want just a job and that's great. But if you're an owner, you have to elevate yourself to the higher level. Yes. You have to reward yourself and pay yourself the proper salary if you're doing the work and ultimately extract you from the work just benefit from the profitability of the business. And sometimes owners pay themselves too high in like a salary instance, right? It's not, dude, it's as not I wrote that, it's all my yeah. books. Yeah. yeah. And what they do, their lifestyle adjusts. Yeah. So here's the thing. I'm really into behavioral concepts. So I talked about Prattfall. There's one that's really interesting. It's called Parkinson's Law. Nothing with Parkinson's disease. Okay. Parkinson's Law is this interesting phenomenon in humanity that as a resource expands its availability, we consume more of it. If you're given more time to complete a project, it takes you longer. If you are given more money, you will find a way to spend more. So as we take more and more salary for ourselves, we cap out our lifestyle to match that salary. And God forbid, one month, we don't have that normal salary. Everything collapses around us because we're maxing our lifestyle. God forbid you want to do something different with your life. You, you can't. You, can't. you become can't. trapped. Yeah, you, you become trapped, trapped by to, the money. Your income. Yeah. So, man, I know you have to get out of here pretty soon. So I always like to ask two questions, uh, yeah. kind of as we, as we wrap the podcast, uh, why in the world would you sit down and talk to some guy that you've never, uh, met before that? Look, I, I don't think I'm going to help. Maybe you'll sell a book because of this podcast, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. like, you know, like, I, I don't know, but like, like you're a busy dude, you have a lot going on. Why take the, why take the time out of your day to do a podcast that really doesn't matter? Well, well it doesn't matter. So you, first of all, your team reached out. And I was impressed. Who was it? I actually Lori. Had it down. Lori and Ronnie. Yeah, Lori. Yeah, Lori reached out and I was like, oh, this is cool. Listen, I, I don't get an opportunity too often to speak kind of the real talk. It's usually just like, oh, tell us about your new book. Give me the three tips. I'll mm -hmm. see you later. And uh, I don't get to talk about the humanity behind it. And when I was reading about you, checking out what you've done, I was like, oh, this is something that's I don't typically get to participate in. So selfishly, it's a way for me to share kind of a raw side that people are. So it was, sure. it was selfish of me, but I really like that approach. Look, I think, uh, I think we have to realize that sometimes, right? Like the world has to stay in balance, I believe. And so do you, you have to realize that, you know, 
the altruism and the narcissism of, of yourself, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like very, yeah. Very altruistically. But when people say, oh, I just give, bro, that's like my number one thing of you're full of shit. Yeah, yeah. Red it's flag. Like you are around. full like, of shit. I don't know about that. Yeah, nobody yeah. just gives. There's yeah. got to be something in it for you. I can so, Um, Last question is, I believe everyone has like this, this power, like a superpower that they go out and give to the world. And then the world gives them back so much, something, something for that almost, you know, maybe it's money. Maybe it's not, I don't, I don't know what it is. You know, what do you think your superpower is? I, so I think it is the ability to simplify really complex stuff because I, I, I'm not that smart or capable. I can't understand complex stuff, but I get enamored by it. So someone tells me like how an account, how accounting works. And it, it just, first of all, weighs down on me. But then I'm like, well, how do I make this so simple? Like we shared. So mm -hmm. I, I really believe my life's purpose, my way I can be of service is to simplify entrepreneurship. How it comes back, honestly, every book I've done, every piece of research I do, I deploy in my companies. Um, and, and, and it becomes an accountability mechanism. I have to live by these principles. Profit, I, I've had 49, or is it now 50 consecutive quarters of profit distribution. It's, it's massive, life-changing for me. Honestly, I don't know if I was stuck with it because it's not easy. I don't know if I was stuck with it if I didn't write about it. So everything I give holds me to that standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. It's interesting. You know, I, I said we, I had this martial arts consulting business, but we had martial arts schools first. And I'd, I, I think the martial arts consulting business, the biggest schools that it's helped are my own. Because it's yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah. My, talk, now right? I, like I train my employees just the way like with the, the employees get trained off, off of these videos that we make for these other people. But it's like, this is how we do it. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Instead of me training you just here, here's the video. Watch yeah. that and then we'll come back to it. So it's really interesting how, how your own work really helps yourself a ton. So I'm with you. Uh, Mike, tell everyone where they can reach out to you. They can find you. They can find your books, uh, social sure. media, all that stuff. Uh, my name is Mike Michalowicz. No one can spell it. So I'll give you a cool shortcut. I mean, it's not cool. Mike Motorbike. It's a nickname I got in grade school. It's the only one that's not like X-rated. Other, <laughs> other ones I can't share. But so I got the domain, mikemotorbike.com. Okay. Try to go there. You'll see all the work I do, all the research I do. I used to write for the Wall Street Journal for years. All that stuff is uh, available for free at mikemotorbike.com. Mikemotorbike.com. All right. Whoever, Mike, thanks for coming on. Uh, we'll do it again sometime, maybe. That would be uh, fun. Thanks, yeah. brother. Guys, as always, uh, Mike has his unique superpower, his, his thing that he goes out and he gives to the world. Uh, I have my own unique thing that I go out and I give and get back from the world as well. So don't go out in the world and try to be Mike and don't go out in the world and try to be Elliot. Everybody could please go out there and find your own power. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Gospel of Fire. If you enjoyed the episode, I'd love a review on iTunes or wherever you are listening to this podcast. Don't forget to follow me on social media at firemarshall205. If you are a BJJ enthusiast, check out my YouTube channel. I put all kinds of instructional DVD uh, videos out on there. So go check it out. My book is still out on Amazon by the same name as the podcast, The Gospel of Fire. So if you are interested, go check out that. And most importantly, guys, go out there every day, find your power. Thanks a lot. Guys, look, I get it. I totally get it. You opened a martial arts school and man, it's kind of crushing you. There's all this other stuff to do other than teach, right? You love teaching. You love jujitsu. You love Muay Thai. You love karate, whatever it is you're, you're teaching. And man, but there's all this other stuff. There's, there's the front desk. There's, there's taxes. There's curriculum. There's cleaning. There's, there's problems, staffing, covering. Whew, man, it's so much. It's so much. Well, let me tell you, uh, we have started what's called Easton Online. And Easton Online is here to solve all of these problems for you. Easton Online is a digital academy for martial arts school owners and managers. will help you establish or enhance your business with best practices. Most importantly, we're going to help you get back to what it is that you love most, teaching and doing martial arts. Okay, so for more information, guys, go to easton.online. Again, that's easton.online. Add your email. You're going to get notified about the course launches. Our first course is going to be all about the first impression specialists, your front desk.
and all kinds of stuff, special offers, promotions, as well as we started a podcast by the same name, Easton Online, that's going to talk about our process of how, how we went from a tiny little martial arts school to what is now seven martial arts schools, seven Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Muay Thai schools um, in a very holistic way that we believe um, kept the integrity of the art and also deals with its people very well. So again, easton.online, enter your email and you're going to get all, you're going to get everything you need right there. So thanks guys.